like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine's Healthy Longevity Webinar. Uh, we're very lucky to have Evelyn Bischoff here tonight, and she's both a scientist and a clinician, so she'll be telling us her perspectives on longevity. Uh, please use the Q&A function. Uh, we'll take your questions uh, and uh, try to ask as many of them as possible. Um, and uh, before we do that, we have a Diogo Barodo, who's a postdoctoral fellow in the, La in the Center for Healthy Longevity. And he'll be talking about a recent paper titled in Nature Metabolism titled, titled Fasting Drives the Metabolic, Molecular, and Geroprotective Effects of a Calorie-Restricted Diet in Mice. Diogo? Thank you so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here again in the Aging Seminars. Uh, my name is Diogo Barodo, and I'm a postdoc in Brian Kennedy's lab. And today uh, we are going to talk about a study that is called uh, Fasting Drives the Metabolic, Molecular and Geoprotective Effects of a Calorie-Restricted Diet in Mice. And this is from the Lemming uh, group. Um, there are two concepts that we have to have keep in mind or learn about before we analyze the study a tiny bit. And uh, the first of all, I can actually introduce to the audience with a quiz. And the quiz is, there is a monkey on the left and a monkey on the right, and which one is the oldest? So I'm going to give uh, three seconds to the audience. So actually this is a trick question because they are both the same age. So they are both middle-aged monkeys. And the difference here is that the monkey on the left is just a normal middle-aged monkey. This is how they look. But the monkey on the right was actually fed a 30% calorie-restricted diet. So each day eat 30% less calories than the other monkey. Uh, and we can see, I mean, it's bluntly, bluntly obvious the, the difference, uh, how they look. So this is to showcase that calorie restriction is uh, arguably the most well-studied way to extend health span and lifespan, and is very robust. So it's reproducible across model organisms. Uh, the second concept that we have to keep in mind is actually fasting. Uh, so fasting here uh, refers to time-restricted eating. So it means that within a certain window of time, we eat and then we stop eating for the rest of the day. Uh, it's also a very well studied uh, uh, feeding regimen. And uh, in here, I show the results in mice. This is a relatively recent paper. So mice that are fed 24 hours at libidum, so they eat as much as they want whenever they want. They have the normal life lifespan, so there is no lifespan extension, and they have the normal uh, uh, disease onset associated with aging. Then if we keep uh, feeding uh, the mice the same quantity of food, but restricted to only 13 hours, so they are fasted uh, for 11 hours, we see some lifespan extension and some uh, delayed disease onset. And then if we actually do the, cal the calorie restriction, in this case also 30%, uh, which the mice, because they binge, they know that the food is going to be there. So they just eat as much as possible, as fast as possible. So it takes them about three hours on average. Uh, so they fast for 21 hours. They get the full lifespan extension and delay disease onset. So these are the two concepts. And this 
uh, particular point here, the, the binging of the mice is actually the problem that the, the, the current manuscript is trying to, to, to study. So it's very hard to untangle calorie restriction from fasting because just by eating, because of this binging behavior, the mice also fast. And we want to study which one is actually responsible for these benefits in health, fasting or calorie restriction or both. So the first experiment, uh, there is a group with a uh, head libidum diet, so they eat as much as they want whenever they want. Then we have the, the diluted head libidum. So this is a diet that 50% is the, the, the rations, which all show that the mice eat, and 50% is uh, uh, indigestible cellulose. So this eliminates the fasting factor because mice are going to eat, and there is volume of food is kind of the same, but because they don't digest cellulose, they are actually uh, roughly equivalent to have a 30% calorie restriction. Then we have the multiple feed uh, group, which also is caloric restriction, but it's automatic machine feeds the mice three times per day. So this eliminates that binging behavior. And then finally, we have the same calorie restriction group as before in which they just get the food once and they eat right away because of the behavior. And uh, what we can see is that fasting is uh, required for the benefits of calorie restriction. So in here we have the body weight, the lean mass, the fat mass and adiposity. And uh, uh, the control group, of course, gets a bit of weight with the age. Uh, the caloric restriction eventually also gets the weight, but it keeps all the lean mass and it, it has much less fat mass. So whatever it, is the difference between the weights is mostly fat mass. Uh, that doesn't happen with the other two groups, even though they are caloric restriction, because they are not fasted. The weight that they lose, which is actually quite a lot, it's actually in lean mass, um, which is not desirable. Second, just to show another very important uh, uh, result, the, the author, this uh, paper has a, a big uh, 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 wealth of data, but I can only go so much to this presentation. So this is insulin sensitivity, which is really important for the onset, for instance, of diabetes. Um, and we can see that uh, caloric restriction mice do have insulin sensitivity, but the other groups are do not. So it appears that fasting is also required for this benefit. So faster, fasting is required. The question is, is it sufficient for the benefits of calorie restriction? So if I fast, but I don't, I don't do any caloric restriction, would I still have benefits? And in here we have, again, the ad libidum group, the caloric restriction group, but now we have a group that it has unlimited access to the food. So you can eat as many cows as you want, but only for three hours. So the fasting or time-restricted feeding protocol group. Uh, so in here, the same parameters I mentioned before, uh, what happens is that the body weight, uh, they also lose body weight, but again, it's mostly uh, fat. And the time-restricted feeding group actually even keeps muscle mass better uh, or lean mass than the caloric restriction. So it seems to indeed recapitulate all of the benefits of calorie restriction. Just to show very quick, insulin, in terms of insulin sensitivity, uh, it's kind of the, uh, the same in that the time-restricted feeding uh, gets most or, of benefits of the calorie restriction diet. So the conclusion is that uh, uh, time uh, sorry, fasting is indeed uh, necessary, but also sufficient for most of the benefits of calorie restriction. In the more late terms, we are not only what we eat, but also when we eat it. And that's all for me today. Thank you. Thanks, Diogo. And uh, I've seen those pictures of the monkeys before. And, you know, when I look at that, I think it, it raises the concern about calorie restriction because the monkey on the left definitely looks older, but the monkey on the right to me, looks a lot angrier. So I'm not sure <laughs> about the calorie restriction strategy. Uh, maybe Evelyn can comment on that too. Uh, it'll be great to have uh, hear her uh, talk today. Evelyn Bischoff is Associate Professor of Shanghai University Med uh, Medical Health Sciences, uh, Longevity uh, Physician at Healthy Longevity, Inc., Chief Physician Associate for Internal Medicine at University Hospital of Jiatong, uh, and on several advisory boards, um, and she's been uh, over a decade practicing medicine, thinking a lot about aging. So it'll be interesting to hear her talk, which is titled Longevity Medicine Protocol, Restoring and Maintaining the Biologic Age of the Optimal Performance. Thanks for coming on the show, Evelyn. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a great pleasure and honor. And uh, let me congratulate um, the entire team, you especially, for setting up uh, this, um, this series of events that are extremely, extremely useful and uh, credible in the 
in the ecosystem. It's my great pleasure to speak today and I would try to give a little bit of a perspective from, I think, the almost the end chain of longevity medicine, which is um, the clinical part. And what uh, are we doing, the longevity physicians, or what are we trying to do and what are the future perspectives? So thank you very much for this kind invitation and introduction. Um, when I was preparing the talk, I was I was thinking how I should start. And since longevity medicine, for me personally, at least, and some of my colleagues, begins um, at the birth. So um, I went back to the childhood and I remembered one of the phrases that I'm coming back to very often from, from Lewis Carroll, uh, Listen Wonderland, that we actually have to run double as fast in order to, to move from a place and, and to run very fast just to stay in a place. And I think that fits very well the concept of longevity medicine at this point, because um, whatever is happening in, on the side of the research is, I think, even higher than exponential. The other question is, what do we translate from it? And this is, I think, also another phenomenon in longevity medicine that we are seeing. Doctors, they have to learn all the time anyway, um, after they have, uh, they have finished the medical school. So the constant learning is there and the translation is most of the time also there. However, in longevity medicine, this is one of the most important parts and it happens at such a speed uh, that I have not seen in any other disciplines. And at the same time, the patients, um, people, healthy individuals, hopefully, are at the level at the moment uh, where they already themselves are very much educated in longevity or they are seeking information. And they also have already this so-called tertiary digital layer. So they are there and the tertiary layer is also there. So they produce a lot of data, as to say it. So um, Elon Musk also mentioned this, um, a very good example. Even after somebody, somebody dies, um, there is so much left behind, even when we look at all the emails and everything. So a lot of data is being produced and patients are different than before. And at the end of the day, what we are looking at is really how to combine in a very symbiotic way and the AI and the AI. So the artificial intelligence and the human intelligence in order to have a very beneficial digital extension for the physician and for the patient, hopefully in the future more of a guide, of a longevity guide and a uh, healthy individual, that will lead to what we will see an optimized performance and an optimal biological age at least frame for, for, the, for an individual. And so when we see at the medical evolution or revolution, when we see at all the uh, key points that were happening along the time, uh, along the areas, uh, we can see you know, penicillin development or the vaccine development. So there were main points, main pillars, but they were very much focused on, on one domain and that, is, that was then expanding. And what we see now is something that is extremely multimodal, um, that is um, very heterogeneous. And we are bringing it, it, trying to bring it into something that we can actually apply. So in terms of longevity medicine, the evolution of the revolution is rather punctual and includes methodology and, of course, slowly also some of, of the applicable uh, actionable items, therapies in this, in this, uh, in this um, idea. So we have by now some of the measurements that we can use. And those measurements, even if they are imperfect, I think they are very useful simply because we then can identify more and more biomarkers and hopefully arrive at the point where we can have a very credible set of uh, really valuable and then also uh, validated biomarkers of healthy aging. Therefore, we are now at the phase where AI is transforming not only the entire world and the society, but also medicine. And uh, we are not really transferring fully, but we are seeing from two to three pillars of medicine. So there is the reactive medicine, the medicine that is treating diseases, things that we are used to. A patient comes to the doctor with a problem. The problem is being managed. 
There is, of course, already prevention, very good prevention. There are proactive preventions, primary prevention. So things that we know, the screenings for mama, uh, cancer, for, um, for, for other diseases that can occur for osteoporosis and so on. There are early preventions. However, AI and especially some of the methods that I will show later allow us to move to a yet another level of prevention into an AI-driven precision medicine that is not always uh, not only looking at preventing something at an early stage, but actually to assess what are the risks of a specific person at a specific point of time to develop some sort of disease. And then, of course, to bring it to the point that those risks will be mitigated early enough and hopefully eliminated. So when one would ask what is longevity medicine at all, is there a definition? Well, I believe nobody um, claims to, to, to define it, but what we, for example, used in, in, the, in the publication recently last year with Dr. Kai Fuli and with uh, Professor Javorankov was that longevity medicine is really a precision medicine that is driven and powered by AI in order to promote, enhance health span and lifespan, more of health span than the lifespan. So it's it's really more about the healthy longevity than extending life. That's that's not the primary goal. And when one looks at the characteristics of longevity medicine, from that one can also deduct what is being done and what are the two pillars that I will present later. So as we can see here, longevity medicine is definitely uh, the base is the 4P medicines, the precision, personalized medicine. It's very data-driven and it's individualized in a, in a perfect world. It's really individualized for a specific person at a specific time. And it does not only have trajectories, but also has strategies for that specific person. And of course, it's fueled and fueling biomarkers of aging. And by, it's, it's really fueled by cutting-edge researchers you can hear uh, every week in this in the seminars that is both the basic research and the translational research and all of this can only make sense when it's fueled and powered by the ai so i will not go into the detail into the slide which you have probably seen several times already but uh, longevity medicine is one of those disciplines hopefully soon it will be really also uh uh, a part of the curriculum and a, and a discipline itself, a specialty itself. Um, longevity medicine is extremely inclusive and very multidisciplinary and extremely heterogeneous. So it always demands a dialogue and exchange uh, with AI specialists, with um, biologists, with um, various disciplines of medicine. And um, all of this is then being fueled also by research. And then the feedback back to the research is very important. So what is the core, um, I believe, of the longevity medicine here? And why are we talking about biological age and the optimization of, and the optimal performance? So when we are looking at the patient journey or at the normal human life, we, we are born uh, and we are growing up, usually then being led or at least seen by adequate physicians. So Clearly, it's a pediatrician in the childhood, then perhaps a family doctor. Then we are reaching a peak optimal performance age. Uh, usually, it's between 20 and 40. So we see ranges. And then there is a decline that we take right now as something given and um, unavoidable. And this decline for some people or for most of the people is coming with age-related diseases. And um, the patient person is being usually then seen and evaluated again by a specialist or by that time by a number of many specialists that are evaluating this patient only within a limited frame of uh, chronological age mostly, so the passport age as to say, and applying therapies to keep that person in that range um, in, in a relatively stable state. In longevity medicine, it's a little bit different. So what longevity medicine is trying to do, and I do not claim that we are there yet, but um, without trying, we can never arrive there. And quite a bit can be done already. So 
in longevity medicine, there is the peak optimal performance being reached at some specific age. However, in longevity medicine, we are looking at the biological age and not at the chronological age. And using multimodal data, the more data, the better, with good algorithms, mostly based on deep learning and transfer learning, we can then not only estimate the biological age of that person at this specific point of time, but also calculate the optimal biological age of that person. And number three, estimate the parameters that have to be corrected to bring that person to that biological age of the optimal performance. And why are we doing that? I think it's important for me also to send the message that, yes, of course, we are looking at longevity medicine because we have that aging demographics, because there is the silver tsunami coming up, because uh, age is number one risk factor for, factor for cancer and uh, chronic diseases. Uh, definitely, it's an important topic because there will be a need at some point of time perhaps to change the um, change the setting of, of, of screening and early prevention, maybe to screening programs of healthy longevity biomarkers. However, I think it is also important to remember that longevity medicine is not purely only a geroscience. It is definitely inclusive and, and learns from, from, from geroscience. But um, longevity begins at birth and actually before. Um, we have enough evidence that a lot of factors pre Natalie, or or even during the childhood, all um, defining the long term risk of that person as he or she ages, and also because at some point of time, hopefully, longevity medicine will be um, able to identify the risks of a newborn um, to develop specific diseases, and will be able to find also targets to mitigate and eliminate those. So. For me personally, working with patients, so I'm I'm coming from internal medicine and I still work in a in a clinic, in a reactive medicine clinic, in a university clinic where we treat diseases, manage diseases, do early prevention, but also um, as a longevity physician. And putting a structure into it, um, I believe there are two pillars for longevity medicine. One is the clinical precision diagnostics, which is very well developed at this point of time, even if there are imperfections in the sensitivity or sensitivity uh, on sensibility uh, and there is longevity interventions so actually what we are doing and this is where the patients are coming and usually asking so what what can we do by now and this this lack of course is much much less developed why because this lack requires uh, rcts right uh, trials and and validation and that's not as easy um, uh, as it seems however talking about the first pillar about precision diagnostics. Right now, the concept is fairly understandable. We have a heterogeneous set of data that we hopefully gain on a very continuous basis from each of the, of the, of the patient, of the individual. And this high dimensional data set uh, is on the one hand being then evaluated and analyzed by um, AI fueled algorithms. And at the same time, it's also adding to the learning of the AI algorithms that are being improved so that at the end of the day, we can achieve not only a precision medicine or even personalized medicine, but really individualized precision medicine. So not only for a person based on a population or similar um, group of people values, but really for this specific person only at a specific point of time. And this is um, possible right now, usually because um, artificial intelligence has developed to a point where we have deep learning and where we have transfer learning. So the neuronal networks are allowing us to, to like use the black box to get insights that are important for the clinical guidance of the patient. And in this diagnostics, we are looking on the one hand on the senescence level. So we have fairly good measurements already for some of the senescent like um, points, um, telomere length or methylation lengths. Um, I believe very soon we'll also have very good um, mitochondrial dysfunction measurements. So this is one point. And at the same time, we still go to this reactive medicine. It's, it's still a part of longevity medicine. 
where we are looking at the markers of aging. So we are looking here at the systemic level, we are looking here at the tissue level and molecular level, um, using some of the measurements that have already been existing or, and are being improved, or um, new methods of measurements that are more patient-friendly and mostly point of care, so done at home. This is just an example how it's done for in, in human longevity. So as you can see here, there is a huge amount of data that is being collected from each patient or each individual, as to say, because we hope that everybody is healthy, but it's over 150 gigabytes um, by just one person. And it's multimodal, again, meaning a lot of different data from imaging, from the molecular basis, from all the omics, um, then also functional tests and so on. And based on that, some of the measurements are already available that are helping us to do something above the reactive, reactive medicine, which is, as I mentioned before, uh, for example, the development of, of risk scores for specific diseases. So polygenic risk score is, uh, is, a, is a very valuable tool in uh, our practice to really say, well, this patient has this and this risk for, to develop not only cancer in general or obesity and uh, associated diabetes, but specifically this or that type of cancer. And the same goes for other diseases. And of course, what we are mostly interested in are the diseases that they are age-related. So besides of cancer, which is the number one disease that is age-related, of course, also coronary or CVD diseases in general, cerebral diseases, and so on. What is also very valuable and useful is the pharmacogenomics. So which medication is actually useful for a patient or not uh, based on the genetics? Sometimes we are hitting the wall with some of the medications and we don't know why. So it's more of an empirical testing, but pharmacogenetics is actually helpful in that sense. And at the end of the day, as you can see, it's, it, it, it's a bunch of data and it's a lot of testing that is, at the end of the day, is giving an output in terms of health intelligence report. So with this, the physician has a status of a patient. Now it's the question how often those tests have to be done and what is the, patient, uh, the, the physician then doing with those tests, how he or she is leading the patient. That's, um, that's the second pillar that we will be talking about. And um, we know that with the age, the physiology or the physiological output and performance are diminishing on this, from the cellular to, to the systemic level. And the epigenetics also plays a very important role. And I believe it's very nice to know that, yes, indeed, all of those things are diminishing with the age. So you can see here, even with the values, but um, why do I go away from, from those types of static um, statistics? Because the healthy longevity is really uh, very variable. So biovariability is, is, is huge. And it's very easy to say uh, or to identify those um, aged people who are very healthy, very fit, and those who are frail or already uh, comorbid. But it's very hard to assess those that are in the middle and uh, to, to really capture their functionality and their potential frailty. So we, we know also that frailty is not something that is very often obvious. Sometimes it actually requires a very small triggering uh, event, such as chemotherapy or radiotherapy, um, and, and then the frailty uh, shows up and reveals itself. So it's for, very important to have constant measurements uh, especially to assess where this person is stay, really um, standing on this, on this uh, sliding scale. And um, where I see the future here is definitely um, with the increasing demand from, from those individuals to be measured and um, to develop some translational applications, or we need to definitely increase the monitoring and increasing monitorings means we definitely have to look more and more into point of care centers and also monitoring at home. And we have an abundance of those. I think I do not have to list them all, but definitely uh, uh, those are all applied in patients. So I know that some of the patients are listening in right now and, and they all can confirm that they are all on CGM, they are all um, tracked on apps or at least some selfies um, from, from their daily ratio, um, 24 hours monitoring of, of their vitals and so on. And all those 
data are then fueled into algorithms on using some of the age clocks or some of the um, some of the markers of aging that can help me as a physician to actually see um, are my interventions useful or not. So when we are talking about the longevity interventions, um, this lack, as I mentioned before, is not very strongly developed yet. So um, when we are looking at the field of geroprotectors and synolytics, an open database on the, of, of ongoing trials. And I'm very optimistic in terms of, of those coming up. Um, but um, the application of those at this very moment is quite limited. So, um, of course, some of the patients are right now um, taking in the NAD boosters and we are experimenting more or less, experimenting in terms of looking at the studies uh, with several medications that are uh, that are alternating the glucose level and the insulin response. However, as I mentioned, the longevity interventions are still very much based on um, lifestyle interventions, as mentioned in, even in the presentation uh, right before, um, time-restricted diet, uh, a lot of exercise, a lot of sleep management, um, a lot of um, a lot of psychological um, manipulations and, and a holistic point of view of those. But there is a very big demand, not only in, in terms of delivering of those interventions, but also even with those interventions that we have, we still have a lot of, unopened, of unanswered questions. Like, for example, even how much of the NAD boosters one has to take or what is the best way to store them? What are the risks? Um, where are the tests? Which tests would be the best to actually evaluate if they are working or not? What are the real side effects besides of those few that we know? So um, all of this, all of this, we are still working on. Nevertheless, as I mentioned, I think if we don't do anything right now, we will never find those answers. So this is why the longevity protocol should definitely implement measurements that could at some point of time help us to, uh, to, to find the best way to evaluate the efficacy of those geroprotective and synolytic interventions. And talking about protocol, it's very granular and it's very individualized. So everybody uh, will have uh, different uh, frequency of tests that have to be done, also a different panel of tests that have to be done. Of course, there's a difference if the patient is already comorbid or had a previous uh, disease um, that required interventions or needs uh, an active surveillance or so post, post uh, onco patients, for example. And the monitoring in those protocols will be also very variant. So from 24 hours continuous monitoring to one, one test per year, for example, uh, um, methyl age, um, this, is, this is not something that will change very, very rapidly. And uh, it's very important also to educate the patient about the difference between biological and chronological age. What I see, not, not only in the longevity practice, but also outside of it, um, in the reactive medicine world, more and more patients are asking, how can I evaluate my biological age? And um, there are already many aging clocks that are out there, not to do uh, promotion for anybody, but I, I personally, I like the deep aging clocks. And um, there are different modalities where they can be used. Also, again, also with different frequencies. I very much like to use the blood-based um, clock because I can repeat it um, easily. It's minimally invasive. Um, it allows me also to estimate the age relatively precisely. And because I can see the changes that are, um, that are applied by the, by the uh, interventions relatively fast. So the age matrix is not only allowing us, for example, to, um, to, to capture the biological age of the patient, as I mentioned before, but also to identify the parameters that are not optimal. And this is very different from the, from the tests that we are um, used to in, in the hospitals, but um, they are actually um, fitted for this one individual patient. So um, this is what those aging clocks are doing. And to sum up, uh, this is how a longevity plan for, for a patient would look like, for example. So it's really a multimodal approach, implementing um, monitoring, implementing uh, supplement medications, regular tests of different, um, different kind. And then, and then at the end of the day, also evaluating if this treatment is or is not 
useful. So here, for example, um, there's an anonymized patient that that is treated already for several years. And you can see here that although his chronological age is increasing, the biological age is, um, is, is remaining at more or less the same level. Um, due to time ref restrictions, I will skip uh, some of the slides and just mention that the role of longevity physician is, uh, is a very important one. And we'd like to encourage all of the colleagues out there um, to consider taking upon this path and, uh, and embrace longevity medicine. There are now also uh, opportunities to learn about longevity medicine. There are free courses out there. Um, and uh, it would be great to, to see you in that field. Thank you very much and open to any questions. Great, Evelyn. Uh, thanks for your talk. I mean, I think that raises a lot of questions. I'm sure we'll have questions from the audience as well. You know, I, I wanted to sort of come back to a point you made sort of on the side from the talk to start with. And that's that, you know, when, when people go to medical school, they really, you know, certainly when I was teaching medical school, there was nothing really even forget healthy longevity, there was nothing really about aging in the curriculum. It was really just a collection of different body systems and diseases. And, you know, you're affiliated with a number of medical schools. How much is that changing? Are we teaching these medical students something about the biggest risk for all these diseases? It's, um, some of us do. <laughs> I believe those who are affiliated with universities, um, uh, they they do, right? So uh, I definitely do, um, and uh, some some of the colleagues affiliated with the university are. But our our contribution is minimal, and there are no curricula that are established to actually implement aging or healthy aging uh, in, in into the into the curriculum. Uh, I think this will change. I hope this will change. We are actually actively doing something to change that. And some of the countries are really embracing that and want to implement at least a course into the curriculum. So, uh, for example, Russia and, and Israel and hopefully um, also China, where the progress is very, very rapid. And they, uh, they start to embrace it and to implement it into um, into the curriculum. However, I think before we teach, we need to also have a set of very credible ways of how to teach and what to teach. And um, we need more people, more MDs, MDs who are actually working with patients uh, to, uh, to embrace on the journey of developing such a curriculum. Because really, you know, it, if you're going to take this to the masses, you need educated general practitioners that can at least interface with people taking these tests and and uh, help them navigate through the complexity of aging. And I feel like that, uh, you know, most general practitioners today are not taught anything about this. And some have picked it up on their own and some haven't. But when you talk about scaling healthy longevity, this is a, a big issue. I think. And also there is a lot of stigma associated with that when longevity uh, as a word pops up, everybody uh, immediately associates it with, with extending the lifespan. So it takes a little bit also of changing uh, the stigma and of moving the inertia there in, in that field. Yeah. How much inertia is there around longevity in China? Just out of curiosity, because you know, every time I go to, well, I mean, every time I, seems like there's more of an understanding of healthy approaches and, and, you know, you can't go to a temple in Asia without a longevity, you know, character everywhere. And so, you know, it seems to me like in East Asia, there's a little bit more awareness in some ways, maybe that comes from traditional Chinese medicine, but what's your take on it? Well, that's one of the reasons why I decided consciously uh, during the COVID time where the travels are still not uh, fully open to remain here in China. So I'm, I'm dialing in from, from Shanghai. That's that's my home. And um, I, I would say China has no inertia whatsoever in any, in any area of life. Um, but in, in terms of aging and healthy longevity, um, especially in the research, there is... Re revolutionary speed that that we see far faster than exponential growth mm -hmm. um the understanding of uh, of of people of longevity is tremendous so they are educating themselves a lot from whatever they can get so unfortunately a lot of misinformation that is on the internet is also getting to them but luckily we have some of credible <laughs> webinars and and sources um so the society uh, society's maturity is there. 
um, and and this makes the work of the doctors much easier. Um, so yeah, so China is, is definitely very open and at the forefront of of the translation also of this great science into practice. While we're on that topic, it might be worth asking: How much difference is there in terms of aging from an ethnicity perspective? I mean, you have experience in in the West and with the the Chinese ethnicity. Um, what are the what are pretty much the same or big differences? What's your take on it from a clinical perspective? Mm-hmm. Um, n- not huge differences, but the, the weighting of the factors of accelerated aging is different. So. Um, m- my patients in the US or in Europe, they usually uh, accelerate the aging by um, by lifestyle choices and uh, lack of sleep and so on. Here in China, it's a little bit different. So I think the genetic component is, is much, much stronger. Um, people age a little bit slower up to a certain age, 60, 65. After this, the decline is rather rapid. Um, so it's very useful to start interventions uh, already around the age of 45, 50 to prevent this rapid decline. Um, but in general, in general, I mean, due to so, like social uh, environments and t- the traditions that are here, the aging is, is much healthier um, by, by simple things. Uh, so people are much more conscious, maybe Maybe it's coming from the tradition, but they are more conscious about how much they walk. They, so basically their cardio out, uh, um, workout, yeah. um, the muscle training in every park. There is um, there are handles uh, where people who are, I don't know, by the look, 120 <laughs> uh, working out. So it's very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I noticed that, too, when I'm there and I, I tell people that one of the reasons I think East Asia and populations live a little bit longer is that they haven't engineered all exercise out of their life the way the U.S. has. And, and you see that just walking around China or Japan, or to some extent, Singapore, although it's pretty darn hot here. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about precision medicine and every, you know, lots of people use that term in different contexts. And I like the term. I think it's very accurate as to where we need to go. How close are we to precision medicine? I mean, if, if, People come in the same age, same gender. I mean, how much differences are there in terms of the what what you tell them to do to ex- enhance healthy longevity, and how much of that is driven by the biomarkers and the data that comes in? Mm-hmm. It's a great question, and I, I think it's very heterogeneous. So, um, in terms of precision medicine, I think we're still at the very in, in the clinic. In, the, in terms of clinical translation, we are at a very, very early stage. Um, it, it needs more attention from, from it's, it's our fault, the doctors. We do not really, we are not used to this. We are used to ranges and we are used to dichotomy, men, women, um, but, but also only by, by biological sex and even not that very much. In terms of healthy longevity, we can do more. And I think this is because the new trials that are out there for the monitoring uh, or for the liquid biopsies and so on, they already implement in their studies um, this multifactorial uh, you know, criteria setting. So they look at the different sex, different gender, uh, different ages. They include older people, which the traditional randomized control trials don't. And in terms of practicability, I think, um, w- yes, we can do much more than in the regular setting. So, um, so, so for example, even, even the gender and the sex, um, because we are doing so much in healthy longevity uh, with the hormones, with the microbiome, and this differs, and this is well, quite well defined already by the scientific literature, how it differs and where it differs um, between genders, between uh, different ages. Um, but... I think for me, ultimately, the precision medicine is, is great and it's a first step. But at the end of the day, I really hope that at some point of time, we'll have the individualized medicine where I do not look at groups of people, not even a small group. I really want to look not on, even only at the person, the one person, but at the person at this specific point of time mm-hmm. um, to have this you know, 2D picture. You know, many of uh, the people we've had on the show, we've talked about sort of the new sort of molecular biomarkers of aging, DNA methylation clocks and things like that. 
Uh, I noticed that, you know, in, when you bring someone and do diagnostics, you have a lot of imaging as well. So, you know, things like full body MRI, uh, they're, they're expensive. You have to go, you know, get them done at a center. Uh, how much value is there to that? I know people are thinking about that. Can they just measure their age by sending some blood in, or do they really need to go do these diagnostics and what are the value of them? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. I think and until we have longitudinal data, we will not know, but we have some. Uh, for example, published in 2020 in uh, PNAS, uh, where over 5,000 patients um, uh, were there in the data set and uh, went through the screening, including the whole body MRI, um, where some of the diseases were detected that would have not been detected with the, without the imaging. I think um, it's important to understand that an MRI can be pretty much done everywhere. And in some, in some places, it's not even that expensive anymore. Um, however, a whole body MRI is not really very useful for longevity unless it's fueled or has an overlying um, algorithms on it that will answer questions that we want to answer with in longevity. For example, I will give an example. Um, there is a whole body MRI with overlapping algorithms put on top of it. And of course, this algorithm had, has learned on many, many data of whole body MRI to uh, detect pancreatic cancer or prostate cancer uh, years before uh, even any colonoscopy or any other screening procedure would, would um, allow to, to detect it, or a simple MRI even um, uh, would, would not detect it without those algorithms. So I think that's, um, that's something that is very important to mention. So it, yes, imaging, yes, but with, over, you know, with, with algorithms that are- that's interesting. On top of it. One yeah. more quick question. You know, I think a lot of the people going to clinics right now, are early adopters, so they're willing to you know, wear you know, monitors and take blood and come into office a lot. Uh, do you do you think this is scalable? Can we get can we get it to an affordable cost where the majority of the population really want to come in and do this? I, uh, you know, I, I have a deja vu. I think we we spoke about it the very first time we we had a video call uh, some years ago, and uh, I I am still a firm believer that it we will get to a point where longevity medicine will not be dependent on the budget, not as much as, as it is potentially right now. And um, Elon Musk said something that, that I'm always giving as an answer. I think automatization will bring abundance. And we see that with genetic testing, prices that are going down. And I think uh, with, with the multiplication of the concept of longevity centers, um, we will you know, we will be at the point where everybody can get not only the home monitoring there on a, in a very good level, but also the multimodal precision diagnostic that it, that is needed. Yeah, I, th I agree with you. I think, I don't know how fast it'll come, but I think that's really, you know, in Singapore, we're really trying to do things that are cost effective that we can scale quickly because we want to have population-based approaches. Um and, uh, but I think it's fantastic to sort of compare notes about what everybody's doing. I should bring Max in because we have a lot of questions and uh, I'm sure he's been collating them. Max, what's going on? Sure, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, we have indeed a few questions coming in and one of them is like from Adrian and he was asking about um, the precision records or reports that you showed on your slides. Are they from your clinic or are they research reports or are they like from an outside source like human longevity? Um, the reports are all from, um, the, the, the genetic reports were, for, were from human longevity, of course, uh, not patient bound. It was an example. And, uh, the longevity protocol um, that I showed with the multimodal data and with the medication plan and so on, that comes from me, how I lead the patients, um, further, further on. Yeah. Um, we have a question from David, and he's asking, um, there are many hallmarks of aging that can potentially be targets to improve healthy longevity in humans. And in your opinion, which ones do you think we should be targeting and why? All of them. All of them, and not only all of them one by one, but uh, also their interactions uh, and interplay between. But we are not there yet. 
So we are barely at the point where we are trying to find the diagnostic tools to, um, to, to measure, to quantify those hallmarks of aging, as Mike would say, so basically developing biomarkers of aging. And once we have this, I think AI will help us to also understand how they influence each other. Uh, and, uh, and, and then once this is done, uh, we will be able to target them all. But I understand that the question is also like, what can we do right now? What, what can we measure? What can we do? I think uh, from the hallmarks, you know, what is really well established is, is number one, the lifestyle factors, epigenetics. Uh, this is something that one can modify um, and, uh, and, and shoot. And then I think the second one will be the molecular level of, uh, of uh, mitochondrial health and potentially also the cellular NAD uh, met metabolism. Where do, you, where do you stand on the healthy diet debate? You know, uh, fasting, vegetarian diet, uh, keto diet. What do you tell people? Um, you, with, with the keto diet, you just, uh, you know, stab me a little bit with my heart. So I'm, um, yes, I'm definitely there um, in, in favor of uh, time-restricted diet. So, and but different time restrictions that work for people. So the quality of life is, um, is balanced. Um, vegan, vegetarian, and so on, that's highly individual. I do not recommend that, especially to males. Um, and, but I am also very much against uh, like very protein lasted diet, loaded diet, or yes, uh, keto is uh, definitely not, not in, the, in the spectrum of, of diets that I would ever recommend to anybody. We're agreeing too much. We're not finding things to argue about. This is a problem. Maybe Max <laughs> can ask something we disagree on. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm also not that contrarian on that. Um, <laughs> but, but maybe like uh, coming back to what Brian mentioned earlier, like, I mean, traditional Chinese medicine, it's also like more like a holistic approach to like medicine than compared like to this reductionistic Western approach of like just targeting, targeting a disease. What, is there like a place of traditional Chinese medicine in longevity medicine or how do they interact? Well, I'm not a specialist in traditional Chinese medicine, I have to say. I, I've been here for, for a long, so long time, many, many years, but I never really dive into, into traditional Chinese medicine on a very, very deep level. Um, but uh, we had a very interesting encounter with um, Professor Guo, who was leading the um, traditional Chinese medicine COVID program. And we were put at the panel um, with, with the hope that we will be fighting, simply just like, just like Brian is trying to do now. Uh, so, and um, he presented his concept of how one should tackle an immune disease, especially in old patients and so on. And it was fantastic. And I showed, um, you know, the geroprotective measure, uh, means in, in, uh, in patients or immune aging and so on, inflammation aging. Uh, all the genomics and it was really fantastic how we actually matched everything so he showed something from really from the outside something that was done for from hundreds of years and and i could actually trace it back to to the molecular level so we had a fantastic debate and, and we found extremely many parallels so i guess traditional chinese medicine based just on you know uh, em empirical findings has see, seen that some of the things are working, but they didn't know why or how. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, all the stimulation of the heat shock proteins, all the uh, lifestyle nutritional interventions and so on um, are all implemented. Great. Thanks uh, for like, also like having the dialogue with like people like from other branches of medicine. Um, we've got another question from uh, Dr. C.J. Lim, and he's asking, um, does longevity medicine apply to people with mild cognitive impairment? Is there like something that we can do with that? Yes. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to show uh, three of my slides, but I'm more than happy to dive into it on another um, opportunity. So neuropsychiatric health or cerebral health is extremely important. It's, it's, it's one of the main domains in longevity medicine, both on the level of neurodegeneration, so mild, mild cognitive impairment, or then further dementia of different kinds, so Alzheimer dementia, vascular dementia, and also the psychology of aging. So those are like big, big topics uh, that uh, longevity medicine is tackling. In terms of mild cognitive impairment, and uh, then uh, really the, the, the moving into a full impairment, some sort of dementia, um, there are also two things that are being now explored. One is diagnostic, very early diagnostic, and also predictions. 
So there are now good algorithms based on the imaging and increasingly also based on liquid biopsy or just blood tests that can predict in advance when this transformation, when the transition from mild cognitive impairment to a full uh, dementia um, or, a, or a severe cognitive impairment can take place. Uh, so that's already very, very helpful because uh, usually we are starting the treatment at the point where the patient is showing symptoms. And usually those symptoms are coming very, very late and are hidden and mimicked. So that's already very helpful. So we do have those tools and they are being improved. And in terms of interventions, yes, there are some, some, um, some, some things that we can use already. They are mostly based on the supplements, but we know some of the mechanisms that are working right now where we can intervene and uh, also work a lot with my patients, both on their, their cognitive training, but also supplement-based um, phosphatidylcholine and so on. Great. Um, maybe like a, on the other question that you were earlier mentioning, like at the end of the day, there's like a big role for AI in longevity medicine. And you were also like showing all this different data that is being collected, like obviously like some within the clinic from the doctors, but how easy is it currently if I have like my Apple watch or like just some variable that I go to my doctor and say, Hey, I've tracked my data here, take my data and put it onto your system and onto your computer and analyze that. This is like already something that's implemented in clinics that you can bring your own data. Um, you can, you can, and you should bring your own data. And it's always good if your doctor even asks for it. Um, I, I, I push my patients very much to collect them and to show me those data. Um, but and there is, you know, there is a big need of a really great EHR, so electronic healthcare record system, some sort of a platform in the clinic that can. Um, host all of those data and it's very hard so i didn't see a really good ehr that is that can implement all of all of those multimodal data because it would mean that some some of the people will come with a watch some of the people will come with uh, phone apps some of the people and and there the data are just so multimodal so many so many factors so many variables that most of the systems are not mature yet to capture them all um if anybody knows one, please let me know. But at the moment, I, I haven't seen something that where, where a patient can come and can put in all the data. Um, but there is development of this. So, for example, even at HLI, uh, the, 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 the platform that is being used um, is already learning and implementing um, them all yeah, into one system. Well, uh, yet another problem for technology to solve. Um, maybe coming back to your um, statement earlier, like between like the age differences between uh, Western people and Asian people. Um, we've got like another question from uh, Winfried who asked, are gaps between biological and chronological age significantly different between races? Um, I guess it goes like a little bit in the same direction, but you mentioned like different kind of accelerations depending on the, on the time or age. Could you like talk a bit more about that? Sure. I mean, um, there is definitely not sufficient time to talk about it, but there is very good literature about that. So the aging clocks that are that are um, out there and are being used by, by some of the clinics already, they have been trained on different races. And actually, most, um, most of those studies are showing that there, there was not that, um, that, that, that a huge difference in um, age prediction and age difference between biological and chronological age among the races. Um, so that uh, should not be the main factor to, to look at uh, and to blame <laughs> for, yeah. Coming back a little bit more to like something more applied, um, we have a, a question from Kong Wong, um, and he's, what is the observable gains of these longevity protocols? I mean, do you already have like success stories that like, I don't know, either like men got their libido back or people, women reverse their menopause or like they become stronger or like something like that. Yes. Uh, 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 another way of asking that is, can you just slow down the inevitable or do you believe that things are being reversed? I'm, yeah, I'm not a transhumanist, so I do not, I, I, I do not even aim to really reverse something inevitable. I just hope to prevent, to mitigate uh, um, the aging and 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 to lead the the patients 
to something healthy as they do. But I do have more and more, of course, the reproductive challenges and also the libido and uh, the general um, sexual health in, in males and females is a big, big topic. And I'm very upset that we are not progressing very much uh, in that field. The research is good, the translation is poor, and we don't really understand it very much. Yes, I do have some <laughs> success stories, but just yesterday one broke. <laughs> so I, you know, I can just tell you that uh, one of the patients was was on the program, and and she was she was she's reproductively challenged. She's forty, uh, biologically predicted two years older than her chronological age, which is very rare. It happens to in one to three percent of the population, and um, there was no tangible problem. Like we cannot really find where is the problem. So early premenopause and being on the protocol, she restored her menstruation and got four eggs in her ovary. Um, but then she stopped <laughs> and lost it. <laughs> and uh, just just yesterday, she reported that uh, there were no more eggs and her period stopped. So um, she, she will she will be back on the protocol. Um, and other than that, it's uh, it's you know it's the daily work with the patients and when they get to the point where. Um, we get them off the medication for, you know, the statins and then and, and, and the metformin yeah. and so on. That's also a success story. Maybe um, coming more like to questions of society. Um, you're based in China. And from your perspective, how is actually China in general currently dealing with these problems that is, are associated with like their aging population? Because they just have like a very large amount of like an elderly population that is like coming up over the next few decades. Do they have like a solution? As always in China, great uh, systematic approach of the governance, um, fueling the research of healthy aging, fueling programs, social and scientific programs, and uh, fueling full digitalization of the hospitals and development of internet hospitals. So a massive approach with, with high success yield. Well, great, Evelyn. Thanks a lot for doing this. And we'll bring you back on some point in the future. Thank you very much for having me. Um, oh, anytime. Uh, please use the uh, chat function and the panelists and all attendees uh, button to make comments about the show. Uh, we'll try to address those. If you have suggestions about future topics in the show, you can put those in too. Um, also look at the credits because we may have information about courses and clinical trials that are coming up uh, next week. Uh, actually, next week there will be no show, uh, so don't tune in. But December 2nd, we'll have... Gordon Lynch, who's from University of Melbourne, who's an expert on muscle function and sarcopenia, and Andrea Meyer will be back, and she'll be um, interrogating him. I'm sorry, asking him questions. Uh, and uh, so that should be very interesting. And I'll leave you tonight with some age-defying secrets. Thanks a lot for joining us. My name is Yvonne Swan. I'm 70 years old. I always felt that age was just a number. I can't say what 70 feels like because I don't feel 70 or I don't feel 60 actually. I don't feel 50. I'm in love. I'm in love with myself. I'm in love with everything that's going on in my life. I've been single since 1958 and I think it was a real advantage for me in terms of finding out who I am. I have one son, Larry, who's 50 years old and when we go out, guys think that he's my date. I live in New York and it's great. I just come downstairs, I'm in the middle of everything. My transportation is my bicycle or walking, which I love to do, and I roll a blade. In my home, when the weather's bad, I have the Pilates bench. I also have belly dance tapes. So a couple of times a week, I do belly dancing. I don't have to put makeup on every day, but I always put moisturizer and moisturize the whole body. I try to eat sensibly, and so if I have dessert one evening, I'm not going to have it the next evening. But I love to have a martini or a glass of wine with dinner. Compared to 10 years ago, I feel marvelous. I feel more confident. I feel more beautiful, and I think it's because I've opened inwardly that I just feel the world's my oyster. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing can take this I can see it clearly now nothing gonna bring me down